Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us happily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Friends, I will say yes, say a uh, very warm welcome to Friday Field Church to all of you and to this the East Cheshire Union Song of Praise. We have chosen uh, our hymns for each place of worship and I pray that you all know the tune as well. We also have our Echoes Choir who will keep us strong, I think. The thing is, as long as we make a joyful noise unto the Lord, I'm sure that we'll, uh, I'm sure it will go well. And let us turn now uh, to the first one I'll uh, introduce uh, for, by uh, Jean Clements from New Chapel, Denton. Um, this one was chosen because I actually really like the story behind um, how it was written, um, as the following passage tells you. Our leader was a sunny tempered music teacher called Dory Newport, bunty to her friends, a skilled pianist and trained soprano. She always had high musical ambitions for us, and singing was a major feature of our activities. On one occasion, she decided that we should all write a hymn. She had always sketched out the beginning, think of a world without any flowers. And then she encouraged us to think of other examples of things that we would miss. She gently weeded out the hopeless, inappropriate fear and perhaps on what the hoof put. And she tried to lead us to think of more spiritual matters. By the end of the session, the hymn had taken shape and was almost ready for its debut in Linton URC. Some months later, we learned to our surprise that we had been paid £100 in royalties and the church elders wanted to discuss how best this money could be spent or invested. Hey, we were young teenagers and we voted for a huge party with DJ and Unlimited Cider. We spent a happy evening striking cool, don't mess with me poses while our parents waited patiently outside in their cars. Twenty years later, at Pinnerwood School Harvest Festival, I was absolutely staggered when the children broke into song and sang our hymn. The deputy head, confronted by a wild eyed mad woman with bulging eyes, explained in a puzzled tone that it was a common part of the school repertoire. So I was even more amazed that it turned up as number 168 in the purple hymn book. Seeing it written down looks tidy and more thoughtful and more structured, better than I remember. Possibly Mrs. Newport had more input than I realised, but there it is, and the credit should read. Mrs. Newport and some merchants who spent their royalties on cider. <laughs> so let us be outstanding friends and sing our first hymn, Think of a World Without Any Flowers. <laughs>
considering I didn't know all the tune of that, but I thought we did pretty well. I'd like to uh, call on now uh, Kevin Law from Deppin Field Hall. This hymn takes me back to my days in the Sunshine Primary. Yes, I have been around that long. <laughs> I may not look it, but it is true. Now that I'm a little older, inverted commas there, the words sit well with my vision of our Unitarian faith. We all hope that our lives may, be, may give light in dark places, a strong arm for the weary, and bring joy to all. Whichever umbrella of our Unitarian free Christian faith that you find yourself under, we all hold these values and strive to achieve them. Thank you. God, make my life a little light. Please be honest.
call upon the Lord Secretary for Friday the Lord.
such as a flute or a harp, unless their notes have the proper intervals, who can tell what tune is being played? Unless the bugle notes are clear, who can be called to arms? So in your case, unless you make intelligible sounds with your tongue, how can anyone know what you're talking about? You might just as well be addressing an empty room. There may be in the world a great variety of spoken sounds, and none is without meaning. But if the sounds of the speaker's voice mean nothing to me, I'm bound to sound like a foreigner to him, and he like a foreigner to me. So, with yourselves, since you are eager to possess spiritual gifts, concentrate your ambition upon receiving those which make for the real growth of your church. Concentrate your ambition upon receiving those which make for the real growth of your church. Amen. Sorry. Let us turn now to our next hymn and I call on Reverend Angus Parker from the New Taylor Church. Now friends, before I speak I'd like to say a few words, and that they are, please note that the chorus as it's printed first doesn't occur first. It comes out of the first verse, second verse, third verse, and fourth verse. I believe there are more verses than four, Ken. Uh, how many? I think there are five or six, oh, no. and we keep adding to them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the uh, High Unitarian Fellowship calls this hymn the Jubilee Hymn, um, because it comes from the Jubilee Group. Now, the Jubilee Group was founded by two people. One uh, was the, uh, the uh, was, was Rowan Williams, the past Archbishop, who has quite a few surprises uh, if you read the, the book, uh, Rowan Williams' Legacy. And the other founder of the Jubilee Group was the Reverend Dr. Ken Leach, who we are pleased to have with us in the very flesh here. And it's very good of him to come amongst us and honour us with his presence. And I'm sure he'll say a few words. Now the Jubilee group, and this is where Ken and I are going to disagree a lot, I think. <laughs> the Jubilee group um, was one of those uh, institutions that stand in venerable line of Christian socialism, which I think would like to trace as far back as the arts and crafts movement. And we could include figures such as uh, the Reverend Charles Kingsley and R. H. Tawney, F. D. Morris, uh, people with a certain Unitarian connection. Well, I joined the Jubilee Group while Minister of Bethnal Green Unitarian Church in the East End of London and worked with Ken, who was then Rector of St Matthew's. We had here in Manchester a Jubilee Day some years ago, 1983. We got the way through on that, 1983. And we also had a Conrad Noel Festival at St. Stephen's. Um, and Noel was cured there and was uh, ousted by the Bishop of Manchester for. Oh, of Chester. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, I'd rather play in Chester, but uh, as, as you say, uh, that's a personal opinion. Uh, and he was asking for his socialist views and went on through 
account as a content and when in fact to facts to it. Um, now this hymn was dictated to myself and Julie Wood uh, from uh, Ken's sick bed in Cherry Tree, Stockport. Julie scribed or scribbled as Ken sang and afterwards I printed from her notes. I deliberately changed one or two words to make it more acceptable to Unitarian thought um, and with being unable to read all of Julie's writing there are other changes there are translation problems possibly. My last note is looking at the hymn itself you see the rote reference to the Golden Age. The same pagan Golden Age of peace and plenty in Greek and other myths. The same pagan age referred to in Unitarian Minister Sears' Carol, it came upon a midnight clear and the verse was edited out for many years. Now the question I want to ask Ken is why was Jubilee Group called Jubilee Group? Well, we originally were formed or formed ourselves as a group of priests in East London um, about the time that I came to Bethnal Green which was St Matthew's Day September 1974 and um, we formed a jubilee group about a, a year later as a support group for priests who were um, on the whole within the Catholic wing of Anglicanism and were all on the left politically. Um, we weren't um, a tightly knit group. Um, we had everything on the left from Labour Party members to Trotskyists and anarchists. But we were all on the left to, to such a degree that Mrs. Thatcher um, set up a committee of inquiry from MI6 into the Jubilee group. And like most things that MI6 does, I knew about it the following day <laughs> from ITV Granada. And um, they described us as the most dangerous and sinister um, movement within the church. If only they knew what a mess we were and a shambles we were, uh, but they didn't. And, um, but that's why it was called Jubilee, because we, we thought of resurrecting some of the old names uh, from the Christian socialists, but we decided not to, uh, that they were rather faded. And um, so we said that we'd call it the Jubilee group, uh, but most people didn't understand what the year of Jubilee was all about in the 25th chapter of Leviticus in the Old Testament. And when people quote Leviticus, they normally have other things in mind than the Jubilee year. But it was an old priest in the East End, in fact the longest serving priest, uh, a man called Gresham Kirkby, who started his ministry in Manchester in Gorton, uh, finished in um, the East End and built his own church, St. Paul's Bow Common, which was described by the Architectural Review as the most important church built in the 20th century. And uh, Gresham uh, was the only priest left who had been ordained prior to the rule of compulsory retirement at 70. So he went on forever 
and he died just before his 90th birthday, as he always said he would. And um, like a good anarchist, he was visited by the Bishop of London every day in hospital in the week before his 90th birthday. And most bishops had spent their lives trying to get him to retire, and he wouldn't. But uh, he always said he wouldn't live to see his 90th birthday. And the Bishop of London, uh, who was the first bishop he actually got on with, I think, Richard Charters, um, visited him every day and rang me in Mosley to tell me how he was. And he said, um, he declared his undying faith in anarchy. And, uh, uh, and uh, 13 hours before his 90th birthday, as he'd always said, he died. But he suggested we chose the name Jubilee Group, and so we became known as the Jubilee Group. But a lot of people thought we were all to do with the Queen's Jubilee, and we were all so naive that we hadn't noticed the Queen was having a Jubilee. But, um, that's what our bank um, uh, checkbook said, you know, called us East End Jubilee Club. And John Sayward said, um, who was a, an Oxford College chaplain at the time, and he said um, uh, that it was about time we had a manifesto, and he said, I'd like to do some work on it, um, but I'd like to, uh, uh, my friend Rowan Williams to help me. Well, we all agreed because none of us had heard of Rowan. Uh, he was still finishing his doctorate at Oxford on modern Russian theology. And so we said, go ahead. We Little did we know that he would end up as Archbishop of Canterbury. But be long before he did that, he would join the literature committee of the group. And um, anyway, that's how we became the Jubilee group. And, um, and we, we died after 15 years. We thought 15 was a long enough life for a group. But there's now Jubilee for Justice, which I gather from the secretary, was named after our group. And there's a, a website called Anglican Left, which is also uh, grew out of the Jubilee group. So you can look us up on the web quite easily. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, just one final thing. Um, the chorus was written by Ken because it didn't like the, uh, the original one, which was about St. George. Not anything against St. George. Uh, and when, we, when I saw you in, uh, Stop. Mm. <coughs> First, next Sunday, I think it was, we must have this hymn, and so we did. It's wonderful, this is not the first time it's been sung. I hope you enjoy it today.
those of you who go to East Cheshire Union District meetings, um, committee meetings, will recognise these. Thank you very much. These are our Echoes um, uh, sweatshirts. Um, there are a few cuckoos in the nest. We do have six, um, there are only five here today, from the Manchester District Association. Echoes Choir is a collaboration between East Cheshire Union and Manchester District. And if anybody here would like to join, we only practice once a month. It is a community choir, so there's not very much demanded of you. Um, if you don't know it, just mouth it. And um, we do do quite a lot of gigs. We are in, in a lot of, we are in demand. Uh, and, and, and possibly more for our enthusiasm than the noises that we make. But anyway. We are going to be singing uh, a song called uh, Landscapes of Our Lives and um, it's lovely to follow um, that hymn because this was written, uh, it's, it's more modern than anything we're singing today, it's written by uh, the Reverend Michael Dadson who we share with Macclesfield. Uh, the Newcastle Underline uh, community that it's building will be 300 years old in four years time. And we had a discussion last year about how we wanted to celebrate that. And we had had an archivist who'd done our history. And we did think we didn't particularly want to go down that route. So we started a 300 project. And the 300 project is that we will do 300 things um, individually and together uh, to make this world a better place. And we have a variety of things. Michael committed to write a hymn, so he's the first one off the mark. He's done that. He wrote the words and the music. Um, we're planting and uh, growing 300 holly trees for a national trust uh, place in Staffordshire. We're knitting squares. Somebody is researching um, our history to do a tapestry. Um, we're also doing um, printing large print hymns, so we've got large print for everybody. Um, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, we've got lots of very diverse things and I would recommend it to anybody uh, to do a project like this because people have really taken it to their hearts. Um, so we hope you like this hymn. We hope that you'll take it to your hearts and want to have a copy of it and uh, we'll talk to Mike about how you do that. And we do have our own music.
people who actually like the purple book. <clears throat> it seems as though there are a lot of those who, because they're not used to it, I guess, yet. Um, but it's got a lot of lovely words in it and a lot of lovely tunes. Uh, I've chosen this because it talks about singing, music making hearts rejoice, letting our praises swell like thunder, steady us with music anchor. And till they form a mighty chorus, joining angel choirs above. If that doesn't encourage you to sing, nothing will. It was written by a man with the wonderful name of Carl Pickens Daw Jr. He was born in Kentucky, the same year as me, 1944, and uh, was ordained in 1982 as an Episcopal minister. And he's a fellow of the Royal School of Church Music, Professor of Hymnology at Boston and a leading hymn writer. Now I say I've chosen it because it should encourage us to sing, but I've not used the set tune. I've, used, I've asked for another tune that we all know uh, because I wasn't sure we used the other one. So let's have a good sing. God of praise and God of laughter. <laughs> Difficult to walk. 
Father, we pray for your love and your guidance and your divine light to shine in their hearts. We give them courage, we give them hope. We pray for all those who are distressed. We pray one name on today. Although we have many people that we have in mind to need our prayers this day, there's one name which I'd like to share with you. That is Jane Baratov. We very poorly. So friend, let us open our hearts and our love to pray for Jane. Today. We pray for healing for ourselves, healing for our families and friends, and healing for this world of ours. The Lord grant us his blessing and fill our hearts with a spirit of love and peace now and evermore. I bring greetings from Staffordshire Unitarians. Um, as many of you will know, Newcastle Under Line is the only Unitarian presence in the whole of Staffordshire, and we do get people travelling quite away. The traditional metaphor for our spiritual lives is a journey. Think of Pilgrim's Progress. And yet, it's not the only metaphor. We can think of the metaphor of a dance. And this is what our hymn focuses on. It's from the purple book, but none the worse for that. Uh, and there's another, there's another hymn which mentions dance. in quite a few mentions, but this, um, I'd like to read out, um, some of you will know, I Dream of a Church, uh, by Kate Compton, who is a, is a British woman, she's a URC, I don't know if she's a minister, but certainly uh, very active. Uh, and her third verse, I Dream of a Church that joins in with God's dancing. As she moves like the wind and the wave and the fire. A church that can pick up its skirts, pirouetting, with the steps that can signal God's deepest desire. I think to dance is a very spiritual experience. Uh, this is written by Rick Maston, who died a few years ago, was a troubadour and a poet, and he only ever wrote from the heart and from his personal experience. And I hope that many of us here, I certainly write, share that as a spiritual um, practice. And they say, to sing hymns is to pray twice. I think if we sing hymns and dance, we are praying three times. So please enjoy, and do have a little wiggle if you'd like. Let it be a dance, we do. Let a dance and song be heard. <coughs> Thank you. 
tell you the story of the hymn, or the hymn writer, I'm going to tell you how I came to choose this hymn. When Carol very kindly emailed me to remind me for I think the second time that I hadn't sent a hymn, I was in a foul mood. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of Carol's email, but because it was the week where a certain Anglican vicar in Stanley Bridge had sent out a letter saying that Unitarians were not allowed to take part in the Women's World Day of Prayer Service because we're not Christians. Well, you can understand that that annoyed me just a little bit. And I spent the whole week, along with Andrew and other people, discussing with various people up, and up to and including the Bishop of Stockport to get this woman told off, which duly happened. I didn't feel a sense of victory, I felt, I felt a sense of sadness that in this day and age that sort of thing should happen. We solved the problem by having the service at our church. <coughs> so that went well with me. And I can almost understand people from outside our denomination calling us not Christians because they probably look it up on Wikipedia and believe everything they see. And very often a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. What I can't go with is being attacked from within our denomination. I'll give you two examples. There was a so-called Unitarian minister in London put up a sign outside his church saying, Atheists, welcome here. Which seems to me a bit like Tesco's put up the sign saying we sell horse burgers. <laughs> and in the latest edition of the Inquirer, I'll just quote a little paragraph. I won't mention the man's name because I don't want to give him any publicity. The old liberal Christian tradition is pretty well exhausted now. It had nowhere to go in the mainstream from the late 1970s. Replaced by identity Christianity of a non-objective kind and quite conservative. This is no future for Unitarians. Now I begin to wonder, are we an easy target, those people who think we are Christians? Or what? All you can say about that really is that he's wrong. Christianity is not going to go away. It's lasted over 2,000 years. It's not suddenly going to disappear on a whim of a few people like this. So that's the sort of thing that led me to choose this hymn, to prove that Christianity, within our movement and without it, is still alive and kicking. So I hope you join in singing, in fact, belting out the words, forward through the ages.
with us as we go our separate ways. Make our hearts thy dwelling place, that we may go forth with the light of hope in our eyes and the fire of inspiration in our lives, that thy word on our tongues and thy love in our hearts we may do thy will this day and evermore. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 